Welcome to Screen Quest, a podcast where a fellowship of film lovers and armchair movie experts plays film roulette. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Waterman, joined as always by Mae Finch. Hello, hello. Of course, we have Mr. Will Rotondi as well. Hey, how's it going? It's going well, as you can probably hear from my voice. I <laughs> have been yelling a lot this weekend. Our Jacksonville Killer Queen community hosted an invitational that went very well and was a lot of fun, but uh, there was a lot of screaming involved. And I followed that up by going to a Jacksonville football game and uh, they won, but also, you know, uh, it didn't do any favors for my voice. So I apologize in advance for the raspiness for this episode. How are y'all doing? Uh, recovering from horror month, honestly, and uh, all the <laughs> Halloween shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask if we're, if we're uh, happy to have something that's not horror. Although, like, as we get into this episode, I think you can uh, argue that there's bits in this movie that uh, maybe are a little bit disturbing. But uh, are, we, are we overall relieved to kind of move to a different genre for a bit? Definitely a nice change of pace for me, as mm-hmm. much as I love horror. I would agree. I'm I'm there with you. Uh, So on today's episode, we'll be talking about Solaris, the original uh, Andre Tarkovsky version, not the George Clooney uh, remake, reimagining like different adaptation that came out in the 2000s as part of our director drill down. So this will be the first of two episodes. Uh, We will, of course, be talking about Stalker as well, but that'll be a separate episode entirely. So um Before we do that, I want to hear what you guys have been up to outside of the realm of horror. uh, If you've been watching anything else and just do a little classic catch up. So uh, we'll all start with you. I'm going to go like pull a little audible here. You're at the bottom of my screen. So I'm going to I'm going to work from the bottom (laughs) up uh, today. What have you been watching? Uh, Catching up on Andor. And when it's not that um, I have I go through spells of watching like British panel shows and uh-huh. I was in need of that for like that dose of of humor. So when I went to go visit my folks this weekend, I introduced them to um, Taskmaster, which if you're not familiar with, I definitely recommend checking out as well as QI, which is like a sort of like a, a, a panel show sort of like there's points but they don't really matter and it's just to test people's general knowledge about interesting things in the world and i have i have loved watching those series before um oh oh, geez sorry Uh, a little background noise there Uh, i've loved those shows before and so it was a lot of fun to watch my mom like get into that sort of stuff because she loves british television so and i was surprised she never heard of either of these shows but uh they are definitely they're good time so (laughs) So two things. Uh, when I hear Taskmaster, uh, Master, all I can think of is like the Marvel villain who you know, <laughs> is like featured in like the Spider-Man games, and then like uh, was most recently in the MCU. I think in the Black Widow movie. Yeah. Um. So like, there's that. <laughs> but also, uh, kind of a follow up question. Uh, QI. Mm-hmm. I saw a clip recently of Daniel Radcliffe just like absolutely destroying, like the answer. Like it was like the most obscure. Thing, like ever and he, mm-hmm. he like he just picks it apart and like i, I was just so impressed like i like man he must have had like a classical education or something because um he takes something that i think they were planning on 15 minutes of puzzle solving 10 minutes about and he just like nails it on the first <laughs> guess is that that show like i who who hosts it and like what's kind of like the like the four i know you said it's like general knowledge but like mm-hmm. we can kind of elaborate and maybe maybe that i can uh rest my brain knowing that like i've I've correctly identified this british show because it was definitely a british show that's awesome all right well first off now i want to google it too but uh so stephen fry was the host for um qi for like ages and recently sandy toxvig took over um after they got up to like geez i can't remember which series it was now that they that she sort of made the switch maybe around like the letter m or earlier Uh, Because every series, at least these days, it's a letter of the alphabet that they'll do for their subjects every every uh, season or series. And so uh, it might have been when Stephen Fry was doing it before. Uh, If not, then definitely Sandy. But Daniel Radcliffe, man, I'd have to check. I don't know offhand which one that would have been. I think I saw him in a clip recently as well with like Graham Norton. But it was like 
ages ago too, like when he was much younger. So I don't know. That's a good question. I will definitely have to get back to you on that. But that sounds I'll amazing. I'll find it on Twitter and post it. But it, like, it's amazing because like you can definitely tell that. Uh, like, I mean, he just nails it. But like that, they they were expecting to, uh, that to take a little bit longer and like mm-hmm. be a very obscure thing. So, um, awesome, yeah, interesting. interesting. I'll have to check out Qi though. Like, um, for prob- I don't know if either of you know this, and certainly our audience probably doesn't. Like when I was in high school, I was on the quiz bowl team. And nice um, nerd at the, <laughs> yeah, <was> big nerd. <laughs> awesome at, at the national level i competed um took second place uh my senior year in the the national tournament which uh right kind of sucks you know but second place yeah. isn't bad um yeah our little school from charleston south carolina had a really good coach and uh my brain is still filled with the useless facts um that like i i i don't i can't tell you why certain things have stuck but like a lot of things have stuck um and nice. it was a lot of fun. So uh, QI sounds up my alley. Uh, May, what have you been watching? Well, what have you been up to? First off, I have to say I love finding out which major actors are actually huge geeks. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. It's always nice. But yeah, I have not taken a total break from horror because uh, I just finished reading Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. And so I really want to jump into the Netflix series. So I did start that. I am loving it so far, even though it does go in a very different direction from the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, on the non-horror side, there's a, a cute anime called Spy Family I've been watching. Um, it's a, about a, a spy, an assassin, and a mind reader who like pretend to be a family during the day and then go off and do their various things at night. Um, it's very corny and cheesy and cute. <laughs> and besides Man. that, uh, not too much. Watching Babish videos because I've decided to finally look to finally learn how to actually cook. I also uh, bought uh, salt, acid, fat, heat to try to improve my skills a bit there. I've heard good things about that Netflix uh, show as well, um, but I haven't watched it myself. Oh but, no, uh... I'm I'm reading the book. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I know. I, I was saying like uh, I've, uh, you know, kind of uh, relating the two things. I've heard good things about the Netflix. I'm sure the book's excellent as well. But uh, yeah, Marianne's a big f- uh, fan of the show. They had like an episode per um, each of the titular objects there. So nice. I'll salt, have to check that out next. Will, I will piggyback a little bit. I started Andor. I'm like five episodes in. I've heard um, episode six is a masterpiece. And yeah. uh uh, I can say like with confidence, like it's um, just excellent Star Wars, like and it has its own identity. And I think like uh, I'll say this as a compliment, like it, it at times doesn't feel at all like Star Wars, you know, like other than like tangentially. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, I'm really enjoying that. Uh, let's see. I've been uh, watching, um, I don't know why this happened, but I got like a, uh, just a wild hair to like watch the twilight zone, like from start to finish <laughs> for the umpteenth time. So oh, I've been yeah. working, th- working through that. Um, it's just a comfort show for me. And I know it's like disturbing and scary and spooky and weird at times, but like I can, you know, just, I can chew through like three or four episodes in a row because I've seen it so often. So have you seen the Jordan Peele reboot? I have not. So I, that was going to, I think, be my culmination is like once I kind of like get like into this, like maybe not at the end, but like once I'm like deep into it, like a couple seasons under my belt, because I think like the first three seasons are probably the best, like arguably uh, maybe like take a like a pause and watch the Jordan Peele. How is it if you've seen it? I haven't. So I was going to ask your opinion. <laughs> OK, yeah, I don't have one. Um, I was intrigued by it, but it's one of those things where like I'm a little guarded when it comes to that particular ip just because i feel like it was just done so well um at the time and it, it feels largely timeless and uh rod sterling's from my my hometown and binghamton new york so like Aww. you know um, nice. that's a it's kind of a special connection i've actually been to the park that's like kind of the basis for like the you know like town square like in a lot of the episodes uh, and there's a nice little plaque to them and stuff there but um yeah, I'll let you know when I watch the Jordan Peele. Like, I feel like even though I, I, I'm not sure if that's coming back, if it got canceled after one season, um, it's always interesting to see what somebody else does. I've seen the 80s movie before with uh, 
you know, a bunch of different actors, including John Lithgow and mm. um, Dan Aykroyd and, and some others. And that one's pretty decent. Um, there's sort of four stories told by uh, very famous directors like John Landis and Steven Spielberg, uh, who famously redid the kick the can episode. That's really good. And I've seen like a couple episodes of the first revival in the eighties and it's terrible. Um, so I'm, I'm I hoping didn't Jordan even know Peele, there was an 80s version <laughs> there was yeah there was an 80s oh, no. revival and it was not good I think it was like based off the success of the film which was actually really well liked uh, because mm-hmm. it kind of took that anthology um, concept and like had really well-known directors like do their own spin some of them were remakes some of them were original stories and for the most part people really liked it um, and just the 80s revival did not hit uh, so well, we'll see well, uh, let's let's um, pivot to a uh, a side quest if you guys are ready. It's been a while since we've done a a proper <laughs> regular side quest. Uh, so let's see uh, see what we we get here. I'm giving the cards a little shuffle, and ooh, it's a neuralizer. So this is where we are going to uh, erase a, a movie from our brain potentially to watch it for the first time. I think if I could go back and watch something a uh, film fresh for the first time uh it would have to be ridley scott's gladiator from mm. geez what year was that 2000 something ish or, yeah. yeah roundabout yeah that movie is i don't know it's just it's an it's another epic like i felt like it was it was trying to be up there with like ben hur with it's just the scale of how many people involved and just the like the the visuals of whether it's the Coliseum. I mean, granted, a lot of it was CGI at the time, but just like for the technology that they used and like the chariot racing. And I will even say it, the gore too, man, just got me like the gladiator arena and whether he's fighting a tiger or he's fighting a fellow gladiator. Like, I don't know. I think I always roman movies typically follow the same trajectory i feel like it's always somebody who's in the military who gets screwed over who then tries to get revenge and come out on top but something about just the way they did it i was like this is really good um and you i felt like you root for him uh for was it maximus (laughs) you root for russell crowe's character through like the entirety of the film and some really crappy stuff happens to a lot of the characters. Uh, it's very, I guess it's like Game of Thrones in that fashion. Like nobody's really safe. You don't really know who's going to make it out of the end. But man, like the music is, is uh, it just swells in all the right places. It gets you in, like invested and like energized for what's happening on screen. And it's just, it's visually, it's just stunning. So I would have to. I'd have to choose that interesting pick because it's a movie that uh, I was just whelmed by the first time I saw it. Um, and mm-hmm. second time I saw it, like I remember thinking like, this is very good. Like this is a solid movie, but I, I was also surprised around award season. And of course I can't recall what it was up against. So like it may have just been one of those like, you know, years where the competition wasn't as like uh, fierce as like other years. Um mm-hmm. But I like Gladiator. Uh, I like, you know, gave us like, I think a lot of us, our first glimpse of like Joaquin Phoenix, who's excellent. And of course, of course Russell Crowe's great. And like, I love that you mentioned the soundtrack because like, it is just amazing. That is like the one aspect of that movie that to me that is like really persisted is like, I listen to that soundtrack from time to time um, way more than I've seen the film. So uh, mm-hmm. I like that pick because like, I, I, I myself could stand to, to like revisit it to see, um, I had a really heartbreaking revelation about three years ago, and that was that Braveheart is not nearly as good as it, as you remember. Or I mean, like, at least for me, like I was like, man, this this movie is uh, it's a solid seven point five. Like this is not a ten. And like if you had asked me, like gun to my head, like is brave what 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 is Braveheart? I would have said at least a nine. And like, mm-hmm. um. That's kind of disappointing, you know, a little bit, but that's 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 the nature of uh, of art and kind of how it ages and things like that. So, um, yeah. When we uh, get into season two of Screen Quest, we should definitely add a side quest category. That's just what movie will you never watch again because you know you won't love it as much. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's a very different conversation. Oh, but that's a great side quest idea for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Gladiator before, May? Nope. 
And that was my way of deflecting the fact that I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. Um, I, I, it's one of those ones, like, again, because of my, like, you know, um, opinion on it. Like, I, um, I can kind of shrug that off and say, oh, it's fine. It um, just, like, it's it's not a film anyone has recommended to me that knows my film tastes. And, hmm. like, uh, when it was being, I guess, like, watched a lot, just, like, by my peers and friends, I just was not interested in it yeah, I, it's hard for me to really offer a strong opinion one way or the other i think the score is great and i think will you hit the nail on the head where when you said like it is very much like it follows a little bit of like a template uh and that like spartacus you know the kind of disgraced military commander who like you know has to kind of rise through the ranks of like the the gladiator pits to like regain their honor but um it works like i i just i there are some thrilling sequences for sure and uh it is it is satisfying in a lot of ways. Well, if you guys are ready, let's let's dive into Solaris. I'm very excited to talk about this because this is a movie I had not seen. I put it on there uh, rather intentionally, like this in Stalker, because I was like, I want to challenge myself to like get something off the list of shame. So if you guys are good, you want to dive into Solaris? Lego. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Engage. as always, uh <laughs> initial impressions and then uh i'm gonna just kind of meander through this movie a little bit i suppose i should do a brief summary i guess uh because you know uh, i think this is i won't call it like an obscure movie but a, a film that maybe our listeners like uh, i would say like largely probably haven't seen like it's not as uh established as like a like you know a, a classic um it's a bit of a challenging film so I'm going to do my best here. So here we go. Um, so Solaris uh, is a Russian sci-fi film directed by Andrei Tarkovsky in 1972. And I, I thought this was really interesting. The budget was like less than a million U.S. dollars, which is pretty impressive. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, given like some of the stuff that they do. Uh, it's based on a 1961 novel, the same uh, name by uh, Stanislaw Lem. And it is uh, essentially about a psychologist who is um, enlisted to uh, go up to a space station uh, orbiting a fictional planet by the same name of the title, Solaris, uh, to assess the mental health of the cosmonauts that are stationed there. Upon the arrival, uh, one of them is already dead. And has left sort of a final farewell message uh, because they were childhood friends. And the other two seem to be up to, um, I don't know, their own sort of individual things. And uh, quickly um, things go uh, a little bit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, sideways as uh, his deceased wife of t uh, from 10 years prior appears in his bedroom uh, one evening. He jettisons her via rocket out of the space station only to have her reappear. Uh, I don't know if it's the following night, but it's sometime in the near future. And he sort of just kind of surrenders to her presence and uh, really, like, in my opinion, kind of falls in love, like over it all over again. Um, and has like this chance of like redemption with uh, with their uh, failed relationship. Uh, a lot of other things happen, um, but essentially... Uh, we learn that she is the manifestation of his memories as uh, created by maybe a being down again. We'll get into this like on the planet or the planet itself, but it, uh, she is a being made of neutrinos and is able to regenerate and uh, becomes more and more self-aware. And, uh, you know, I guess like human like uh, as the film progresses um, kind of the culmination of uh, the story is um, she attempts suicide by drinking liquid oxygen, fails because of the nature of her existence, and uh, eventually convinces the two scientists to, uh, for lack of a better word, like execute her or like, and you know, end her like euthanize her um, through uh, radioactive means, which had kind of been discussed earlier in the film. Uh, they use uh, similar technology to uh, neutralize uh, whatever's causing the manifestation of these guests as they're called in the film. And uh, we get a nice little um, sort of monologue from our primary character who is Chris 
uh Calvin, Calvin. right yeah yeah Chris Calvin and he kind of dis- uh is debating with himself if he should leave the station or go back to earth we see what seems to be a reunion between him and his uh you know aging father and only to you know basically have it re- uh, revealed at the end that uh this is on the planet Solaris uh on these little islands that have popped up ever since they've bombarded it with uh, some sort of type of radiation so uh, that's that's the best summary i can <laughs> i can give kind of all off the cuff uh did i miss anything that you guys would uh note before we jump into the movie itself i thought that was great uh, it, uh there was also the saddest birthday party in space ever <laughs> oh my god yes i do want to talk about that birthday party. <laughs> that's oh, all geez. that sticks out to me <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do want to talk about that that birthday party, but yes, there I think that is accurate. The saddest birthday party in in space. I think the only thing that could have made it sadder is uh, Hal nine thousand singing oh, <laughs> as he's being crazy. disconnected over <laughs> the characters having their discussions about humanity. But yeah, it's pretty pretty accurate. Um, so let's jump into impressions again. I'm going to go to the bottom of my screen here. So Will, uh, just initial impressions, and then we can kind of just freeform jazz it and talk about this movie because wow. Ooh, man, this movie was way too long. Um, I, <laughs> and I, I kind of had a suspicion going in it was going to be like that. Um, I, yeah, I think the pacing for me, I just didn't really think was, was worth the amount of time that was spent on it. I think overall the idea, like I liked the idea of the story. I liked, I remember enjoying the book. Um, and oh, you've read the, I think the novel? That, <laughs> Yeah, so I actually, I kind of, (laughs) I probably went in the wrong order again, but I definitely watched the George Clooney version probably about a couple years back and then read the book after I watched the film because I was interested to see if the book would talk more about what was going on than what the film does. Because that one, the Clooney version is a lot more ambiguous and doesn't even like really mention the ocean or I feel like they never even go to the surface. Um, It's just all in the space station and what happens there. And so... Uh, the book kind of filled in the gaps and then I you know when you talked about wanting to go back and watch the original I thought okay well maybe this one will be a little bit more true to that and I think that it is from what I can remember I feel like it's it's much more true to the novel but at the same time sort of inserts a lot of which I guess is very much we could talk about more is the director's style which he was known for which was like these really long takes um, focusing a lot on nature he kind of inserted that whole thing with Kelvin and his dad at the beginning and the end, because I don't really, I remember vaguely that Kelvin sticks around at the end, but I don't remember there being like a reveal that he was hallucinating his father. I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that, but I don't remember there being like an intro with his dad and um, some of the, like the footage that they're watching about a previous um, character's involvement. Henri, I want to say baby. Um, Burton, who had, Burton, I know. Oh, Burton. The, yeah. Yeah. The pilot. The pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when Burton was there previously having like his the recording of his um, uh, just recount of the strange events that he saw on the planet, I think was sort of filling in for some of the like mission logs that Kelvin ends up reading in the novel. Uh, So I thought that was an interesting way to do that. But overall, it was like, man, this movie is just it just keeps going. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which I know is part of it is intentional but for me it just wasn't it wasn't my jam so um I kept kind of checking to see how far I was into it unfortunately but overall you know it's it's good to see it just to you know if you're into the story I'd say read the book first if you're game go to watch the film and if you're curious what the recent version was with Clooney then by all means but overall you just gotta prepare yourself like 2001 it's gonna be long there's not gonna be a lot of music um unlike 2001 there's not going to be a lot of music for this and uh and yeah very long <laughs> i was glad i split it uh, i'm not going to comment on my impressions quite yet but I, I was glad i split it into two parts i watched half of it you know yesterday after the tournament i was mm-hmm. quite tired but i i prepared a strong stiff drink because i did not drink <laughs> at the tournament yesterday I, you know because i was having to run stuff and everything so it was just water for me and I was like, I'm going to have a stiff drink and um, we'll see if I can watch it all in one go. I will. And like, I got to like where like the title like said, like part two. And I was like, nope, yep. uh, I'm good. I'm good for now. <laughs> I will, stiff I will finish drink this is in good. the morning. And yeah. I did. I, I finished it uh, in the morning and I think it worked better that way. But uh, May, what did you think of it? 
Uh, with regards to the length, I agree. It was very slow and very long. But I will say I do really appreciate a film that is over two hours that inserts an intermission. Like, I think that should be a requirement <laughs> yes. across the board. Um, I did not take advantage of the intermission, but I was glad they put it in there and it excused <laughs> the length a little bit for me. I see what Will is saying also about the kind of extended nature shots. And even though it is unnecessary in terms of the larger plot, I actually did like that kind of prologue section on Earth because mm -hmm. it gave me a really good sense of just how just interested Kelvin kind of seemed in the whole project and how... It, it built up a sense of kind of curiosity and dread in me for what they were going to go face. And I appreciated having that before, you know, the movie just opened actually on the space uh, station. I I like the story a lot. And I think that it's strongest in those uh, scenes between Chris and, and Hari and how you see their dynamic change as Hari becomes more and more of a rounded out human. Um, but yeah, there's just like a lot of kind of unnecessary stuff. And I will say that there are moments when I was kind of shocked by the budget and moments I definitely was not. <laughs> For instance, the rain in that opening scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the quote unquote rain. <laughs> I don't even know if it was a rain machine. I feel like that might have just been somebody with their finger over a hose. Like, so. <laughs> spraying it into the air. But yeah. So that kind of broke my suspension of disbelief at times. Or I got irrationally upset by the weightlessness scene because they only had a couple of things floating and they had like liquid yeah. sitting and glasses on tables. Yeah. <laughs> Books. <laughs> Candles. Okay, so you feel similarly well. <laughs> I would yeah, I nitpicked the hell out of that scene. I'm like, what it no. <laughs> But then again, I mean, for 72, I'm like, eh, you know, again, it's not. I appreciated the book. I do. I did like that. But yeah, the but rest overall, of it. I, I liked it. I would not necessarily recommend this to most people, though. I, I will say for comparison, uh, in, you know, uh, 1968. So four years prior, the budget for 2001 A Space Odyssey was uh, ten point five million dollars, so, though, um, you know. I won't say this is a shoestring <laughs> budget necessarily, but it's certainly uh, significantly lower. But oh, yeah. I think that shows. Um, but no, yeah, like I think so. I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll kind of jump right into my impressions. Like I think this is a challenging movie. Like I think this is a movie for like a cinephile, right? Like if you're going to recommend it, I think this movie would come with some uh, context and some disclaimers. Um, <clears throat> I've regularly seen this like in, you know, several top like hundred, like, you know, movies, a list that include like uh, foreign, you know, or international films. Um, and like, I just never, I've been able to work up the courage because I, I knew that it was slow and long and like it, that it really demanded a lot of attention. And um, I can say that I'm glad that I've, I've watched it and I really did enjoy, I enjoyed a lot of like what this movie had to offer do you think there's a lot of fat around the, you know, the edges? Like, I think the, you could have probably had a similar effect with, and, and made this a little bit leaner. Um, but it's not my vision. So I, I can kind of respect that Tarkovsky like wanted to do what he wanted to do. I think it's, it's very memorable. There's several sequences in this that were very memorable to me. And, um, I just I I think probably like the most striking thing to me was the influence that I see from this film and maybe this novel like in other works of sci-fi that I really love including like you know video games even like uh like well, the first thing I thought of was like oh like Dead Space which is uh one of my favorite like survival horror like video games um the like the whole plot hinges on like a surprise twist that you're uh wife who is like called you to the space station to look into something wrong is actually she's she's dead you don't know she's dead but like she's dead so spoiler for dead space i'm sorry um, could you? and <laughs> and every time that you're seeing her and communicating whether it's a manifestation of your psyche that like this artifact is sort of using to manipulate you and um so like i like i see that influence and like i have a lot of respect for it 
Um, I also was quite shocked. Uh, it's the last and this is the last thing I'll say before we kind of like you know get into it um in more detail by like how anti space exploration this seems to be like at a time where like the space race was pretty fierce still i think between america and the soviet union um so i again maybe this is just my takeaway but Tar tarkovsky does not seem to find much value at least like as he's like you know um exploring the themes in this movie with the act of like exploring space i think a lot of the themes kind of come down to like we have everything we need here. Like humanity is the thing that we should look to, not like the stars. And um, I really like that. I kind of, I, I vibe with that. And I'm with you, May, like the nature stuff at the beginning. When I finished this, um, I went back and just watched like the opening like five minutes just because I was like, this is tranquil. Like somebody make like a, a little like um, YouTube, like, you know, channel, uh, one of those little vibe like things where like ambiance, like with some good music and, and this flowing water over the like the reeds and stuff. I, I would totally dig that. You already brought up something, May. So um, let's talk about that birthday party um, <laughs> because I, I really like that. <laughs> um but like i'm gonna let you expound and then we'll kind of bounce you know we'll, we'll bounce off that like um let's talk about that birthday scene a little bit set us up with a little bit of context and then talk about why it was uh was so striking for you so there's been this growing tension through the movie between uh it's now i think is how you say it, his name now and uh sartorius uh kind of against chris and hari because um Chris and Hari are basically just kind of focused on figuring themselves out and like this new weird relationship they're in. Whereas now and Sartorius are like, we all have jobs here that we're trying to actually finish and you're not doing your job, buddy. Uh, but now kind of like, I guess, extends an olive branch and being like, hey, my birthday's tomorrow. Why don't we have a party in the library? <laughs> so uh, he, he sets up the time and place and then... Um, you know, Chris and Hari and um, Sartorius are all there and he ends up being an hour and a half late to his own party. So everyone's already in a bad mood. On a space station with nobody else on it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just them. Like, <laughs> your list of excuses has got to be very, very small for that. But continue. I'm sorry. Uh, I will. Sart Sartorius does make the comment that like, oh, maybe he's entertaining guests, which yeah. like, ah. Uh, it it sounds just kind of like a minor like happy thing, but then you realize like in the in the connotation of the film that means that oh some terrible memory or guilt from his past is manifested most likely in his room, and he now has to probably kill that entity <laughs> before he comes to the party. And when he shows up, yeah, he looks like shit, <laughs> and um. To me, it seemed pretty obvious that had been what he was dealing with. So he gets there. Everyone's already in a bad mood. And um, Sartorius and Chris kind of end up um, getting into a bit of an argument. And then Hari tries to kind of take Chris's side. And then Sartorius uh, snaps at her being like, you're not a woman. You're not even human. And she goes off and cries. And then Chris is upset. And the whole thing is uh, ruined pretty much at that point. I love I one of the things that like I, I got like a little bit of a chuckle out of was like the reference to like this is all like some melodramatic Dostoevsky. Um like I <laughs> love just like the self-referential, like acknowledging like sort of like the connections to like Russian literature mm -hmm. and Tolstoy. Sort of how yeah, yeah, like how morose everything is and um I got a really good chuckle. I it is a sad scene, like don't get me wrong, but um i kind of had that thought where i was like fuck man this is so like russian like in like russian literature and then somebody said that and i was like Ooh, okay like he knows that <laughs> he knows that like that's like some of what the, the the where the conversation is sort of leading to and like what what they're discussing like at least um so it gave me a little bit of a sense of relief um but uh because it's a very uncomfortable scene otherwise <laughs> oh my god yeah like it really i mean just the the sort of things that are being said and um y y when you think of a birthday party it's like a happy occasion and you're like okay this is gonna be a sequence where like they're gonna blow off some steam and maybe have some like some fun and like maybe like forge some bonds and like no that's not what happens at all <laughs> what did you think of that scene well Pretty much the same thing 
just self-referential and just uh, just adding to the fact that I mean there's a lot of I felt like a lot of the dialogue was very like uh, heavy-handed in the philosophical like debate that yeah. sort of there's there's so many like philosophical questions that these characters hammer onto each other throughout this film and no one ever really answers any of them they just sort of like throw them out there as part of the dialogue and i get that and i understand that that is valid it is a valid question but it's like you keep they can just keep throwing out more exposition about you know all of this and then asking what the meaning of life is and you know and uh, <laughs> dealing with their feelings and don't get me wrong I, if i was there i'd probably be going through something similar but uh i think it was just it was frustrating that it just kept compounding over and over throughout the uh, leading up to that moment too and even even beyond that that they're everybody's sort of searching for answers and nobody will answer each other like even when kelvin got to the station and he's asking you know um snow and sartorius like well i guess snow at the time he hadn't seen sartorius yet about what's going on and and snow doesn't tell him anything he just sort of like and tells him later like i didn't say anything because i didn't think you'd believe me so it's almost like they're just they're all sort of trying to find meaning and try to figure out how to to solve the problem but they just keep arguing with each other or they end up frustrated and asking each other these questions and spinning their wheels and they're just all unhappy and so yeah it was just it was very frustrating yeah i feel like it did a good job at least kind of illustrating how when you're confronted with something that breaks your reality uh it it's really hard to focus on the pragmatic when you're like hold on hold on i have the pieces of my worldview in my hands i need to put this back together first because mm -hmm. <laughs> otherwise nothing else is making sense so i kind of appreciated that but it did get really heavy-handed at certain points and um i appreciated sartorius i think the most in that dinner scene because at least he's like the semi-pragmatic one <laughs> 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 Yeah, he's uh he's the one that pretty much like from the get go is like oh like just we're gonna blast her with some radiation like or uh, how do you feel about doing an autopsy on her <laughs> you know I think it's notorious right that suggests that yes yeah um like he has no emotional connection or like it's very clinical like um just he acknowledges you know that Hari is there but um does not really want to engage on a human level with you know that entity i guess we'll call it but um but yeah his pragmatism definitely uh i think allows for a little bit of of comedy in that scene and like i said i just i breathe a huge sigh of relief when they acknowledged because it's like nobody talks like this like <laughs> like i mean not naturally anyway and <laughs> I, I like i i like that they don't answer a lot of those philosophical questions uh, it's, I agree. Sometimes it is a bit heavy handed, but um, I think one of the things that really worked for me like, with this film was um, just like uh, asking those questions and leaving it up kind of to like the viewer. And then like, you know, it makes it a little more like timeless, right? Because the context of when this came out is very different. You know, we're talking, uh, what did I say? 1972, I think, mm -hmm. um, versus like, you know, 2022, uh, very, very different circumstances. Maybe some of those answers would would differ depending on, you know, where you are in the world and what your circumstances are. So uh, I one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on, because we just got done with a whole entire month of horror stuff is like, mm -hmm. uh, I was a little surprised by like how frightening and startling like some of the the bits were like disturbing uh, in this film. I That I did not really expect uh like to, i guess to like the degree that it like kind of ends up being but um did, did you guys uh react as viscerally like, i think the one that really got to me was the uh the oxygen liquid oxygen scene and then the resurrection like was like i thought um you know with a close second being the panic where she comes through the uh the aluminum door and cuts herself but how did you guys feel about some of like the more like i guess um What's the word I'm looking for? Oh, gosh, uh, my brain is fried after this weekend, y'all. Uh, I guess like scarier or like, you know, kind of like tense moments. I was kind of happy it went there, I guess, because I feel like in a lot of sci-fi, horrible things are alluded to. But oftentimes a death is someone just getting like ejected into space. And you don't <laughs> <laughs> you don't see uh, all too much of what happens. Um, so I, I was glad in a movie that is 
asking these very heavy questions about what is, you know, the meaning of of life and humanity and the purpose of space exploration uh, that, you know, it, they got kind of intense with some of the body stuff and like the um, problems of having a body that uh, the entity inhabiting it doesn't really know or understand how it works or what to do with it. And it also doesn't quite work like a normal human body because it has this regenerative property. It's just very bizarre and uncanny and unsettling. Um, and I, I'd agree with you, Chris, uh, the, when she's coming back from the um, liquid oxygen poisoning, it's quite alarming to see her body just kind of like slowly, like piece by piece coming like back to life. Um, and she looks kind of inhuman almost when she's in that twilight zone between being alive and being dead. And I think it's like, it's, all, all like almost like uh doubly disturbing because she's failed to take her own life um as a result of having just existential terror about what her existence means and all that kind of stuff so it's like like this this entity like can't even you know like end its existence like th- which seems really horrible to me like that like you wouldn't even have that choice like if you wanted it right like um, and I don't mean to like sound like I'm glorifying like suicide or anything like I'm certainly not but like it's just I, I find that concept to be really disturbing that like this entity like is in such pain um, that it makes that choice and then like isn't even able to like have that consequence and is just sort of stuck in existence and is, it has to basically resort to you know the two scientists to um, help uh, it you know and uh it's exist existence which it wants to do because of you know just the, the pain and sort of confusion you know there's a lot of confusion but oof, yeah, i just found that whole thing really really uh disturbing i just gonna add <laughs> it's especially dark given that like on a mental level she's kind of like referred to as a child at separate points especially in the beginning when she can't be like left alone she hurts herself if she's left alone and that kind of thing yeah. The first scene where we get like a glimpse of like one of the guests uh, was probably another one. I wouldn't say I found it disturbing. I literally screamed out like, what the fuck? Because I may have like, you know, I, I had finished my couple fingers of whiskey. Um, <laughs> but when Sartorius is, is talking to Chris and then like a little person just like runs out and <laughs> like is like scooped up and like nobody reacts to it really. Like other than he just like scoops them up and chucks them in the, the thing. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> is happening like is no one gonna like mention this like what's going on um, yeah the the interactions when uh chris first gets to the space station are just so weird and that's probably the weirdest one but uh the way they talk to each other is just especially uh disjointed and odd and you kind of expect that from the two guys that have been there a while and going through this but for Chris, it's just kind of like, what what suddenly happened to you, bud? Like, are are the clouds already <laughs> <laughs> messing yeah, with your I head? Yeah, I suppose you, you could infer maybe there's like some... Because uh, that whole space travel scene leading up to him, his arrival at the station, it's almost like he's coming out of like... I don't know if either of you have ever been under like anesthesia, but that's what it felt like to me. Mm-hmm. Where they're like, oh, like you're already like you're traveling. Like, and like, you know, like he seems to be a little confused and... Mm-hmm. um and disoriented and uh that, that's what it run me it was like anesthesia but um so maybe yeah, that would account for some of it uh what, which remi- brings me to another point what did you think of the state of that place like i i don't know like if that was just like <laughs> I, I imagine it's intentional in the set design but it didn't look great like as far as like uh organization and cleanliness like there's just shit everywhere <laughs> Um, <laughs> what do you think of the space station design and the general state of the place? Oh, it's like he comes, what, Kelvin comes on board, walks around a corridor, and there's something sparking, and all he does is just, like, pull the, the cable out and just leaves <laughs> it. Like, okay, we're we're good now. It's not on fire anymore. That's, that's all that matters. And just keeps strolling along. Yeah, there's, like, trash, debris, some, like, random computers, it looks like, or something that are sort of, like, at weird angles when he goes, like, a, around, the like, the floors. promenade. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes they're not there and sometimes they are, I guess, depending on where he is. So, yeah, it is the the organization or lack thereof is very strange. And yeah, then he goes to his own room, which is very, like, well put together. Not, like, nobody's messed with anything in there. So, but there's, like, plastic on every, like, on the bed. There's, like, weird plastic sheeting on the bed and then, like, leather chairs 
and so like the whole like i don't know like there's just very strange aesthetics to everything on the show i agree with you what did you guys think of his initial fit <laughs> his, his initial <laughs> fit you said yes <laughs> yeah um oh gosh i don't i don't know um yeah uh, i feel like understandable like given the circumstances it kind of fit the vibe <laughs> the, <laughs> everything was gone i don't know like i at the, we'll get to that point in the movie like i was just like um sure like i pretty i surrendered myself to like i would say like once i got like 45 minutes into this thing where i was like i'm just i'm not gonna resist like i'm, I'm gonna just i'm gonna take the ride <laughs> Um, I just feel like it, they were trying to go for like what's what's the space aesthetic I know like super tight pants with different like weird loops on them and a mesh shirt and it's like I would see that in a club today um, yeah but <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't fit with any of the other costuming which is like very like pastoral European and it just <laughs> I'll tell you what I vibe with like a hundred percent though was like that uh that country house, man, like in the beginning, like <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like um and even though like the rain effects were stupid, like um there was something really satisfying. I don't know, my brain's weird, so just uh, it's that ASMR bear, kicking in for like yeah. bear with me. Yeah, the rain falling into like the tea and stuff, like um yeah. that like like the shot of the close up of like the rain just like going to there. I was like, I don't know. I was like, man, this is I don't know what this is, but it's really making me feel very relaxed right now. And just that whole like I'm like yes like I I will retire there please like give me a little library a little projector and uh, you know a nice little doggo and um, oh. yeah and a little pond absolutely I love that. They kind of uh, had a meta moment in the movie too when someone's like oh I love your house yeah like I had it modeled after so and so's house or whatever I really love it. What do you guys uh, think of like sort of the anti like space technology? like message of this like I, I i'm really shocked that i don't know how much oversight like the soviet government would have had like in 72 for art um you know um especially something like this that went to con and had like sort of like wide exposure to like the, the world um but i was a little surprised because i'm like damn this seems antithetical to like what the sort of projection of like what the, the what the society is trying to do at the time um that really surprised me. But what, what did you guys think of that? Like, did the sort of the, the did you get the same impression or did you have a different take? First of all, I guess this is probably a better question. I disagree personally. Um, for me, there there is a line about how humans. I don't know if if the word unfit is used, but basically saying that humans are unfit for space exploration because we don't really seek to explore and understand. We just seek to expand the Earth. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Which I think is a valid critique. Uh, you see that today with our U.S. Space Force and uh, <laughs> things like yes. that. Um, but I don't think that's saying that, therefore, you know, all space exploration is bad. I think it's saying that um, we as humans maybe need to grow a bit and shift our thinking um, to successfully explore and actually make meaningful connections. And I, I feel like this whole movie is about, like, the difficulty but value of making a connection with an entity you don't understand and can't understand you. Um, and, like, that may not go well, but it's 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 worth trying. Yeah, I love that. that. My take, like, at least. The line of, like, what humanity needs is a mirror. Like, I think that's a, because kind of going back to that that uh, the resurrection scene um there's like a very striking shot of her like face like in a mirror and like the reflection kind of you know and uh, i think largely these projections are you know it's an inward peak uh, they they kind of act as mirrors right for the people that have manifested them so um but yeah well, how about you? What did, what did you make of the kind of like the thematic stuff? Because I have no idea what we're in store for for Stalker, but I feel like, you know, we should talk about some of these <laughs> themes and see what pops up um, as we go into the next movie. So, Watching this film sort of in a nutshell made me feel like the same way I did watching Sphere, like the Michael Crichton mm. um, book that also got turned into a film that you kind of need to work through your feelings. You got to work. You got to you got to work on yourself before you ever try to go out 
and be put in a situation where whatever you're thinking can be like made manifest. So, or exploring the unknown and not inadvertently, like, cause they talked about like, what did they do? They wanted to bombard the surface with like x-rays or some random thing. You know, I'm mm -hmm. just like, so do you not think that maybe they thought you were attacking them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, just the idea that going out you need to be careful that what you that anything that you go out and, and you touch you will influence some way just as much as you're trying to observe what's going on and sort of the i guess reflected a little bit in that very clinical behavior that sartorius has where it's detached and he doesn't even care that it's that it could be a sentient creature he just wants to understand it and is ready to like murder it and um dissect it or you know analyze it and that to me was like the the other extreme you got the on the one hand that everybody's just sort of they're either paralyzed by their own despair or they want to fight it and do something to stop it and so there's no there's no real attempt beyond that to try and communicate it's all just defensive and that to me, I, I guess, was what I took away from sort of what humanity has to work through before it ever tries to go beyond its own home. I, I was just going to add that um, I guess it's also says something about humanity that at the end of the day, they can't fight it or don't really fight it. It's the entity saying, I don't like this semi-human existence. Please end it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's uh, it's a little bit grim um for sure and uh and like that's their best shot like presumably for the three people that are on the ship too because it's the person that has the most intense uh connection with like a memory right presumably and that's why he selected and like even that like um intense connection and nostalgia and love is not enough to make the entity want to go like you know yeah i i think i can hang around here for a bit and get to know you know, get to know you it doesn't particularly like what it sees what do you guys think the ending of that the movie means so we you know we the entity is eradicated they bombard the surface of the ocean with radiation which results in these planets and um i guess like on a surface level do you think that is actually chris down there or is it like a version of himself that's manifested from you know the memories that are I don't know, pulled inward or towards the planet or whatever however all that stuff works or is it actually him and his father and like what what do you think that like uh is meant to kind of uh imply i guess at the end of the movie because i was thinking about this a lot and i, I it's very ambiguous and um I think there's, uh, it would be interesting to hear your interpretations of that for sure. First, I really like your idea that maybe he's not really him <laughs> because I hadn't yeah. thought about that where it's just, he's just a recreation of Kelvin. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, that would be very like Christopher Nolan esque. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like he apparently he this like... inspired uh, Interstellar big time, I guess, and uh, Inception a little bit. I read like nice. both of those drew inspiration, but sorry, continue. Well, there was so there's like one random quote that I that I was reading back through about how it's something like Chris had said something to the effect of he didn't want to be a solarist who never set foot on Solaris. I think mm -hmm. maybe. So I feel like in that respect. Because he said he did want to stick around and he did want to try and understand what was going on on the surface. I feel like it is him, but I guess it is vague enough that you're not really sure. And I think more to your point, too, like even from the beginning, he's done his. You know, it's just it's so sort of surreal the entire way from when he's on earth to when he gets there and you never really see the craft that he uses to get there all you see is when he's on like final approach to come into the station so i don't know it's it's sort of ambiguous too about just where he came from and how he got there and if he's really still there but i feel like i guess from the surface level of it that he probably did stick around and that that really is him on the planet but he's just sort of lost in his his memory about what it was like back on earth as he's trying to figure out what's going on down there would be my, my interpretation. So 
you're thinking it's more like scientific curiosity mixed with a little bit of like, I mean, obviously it'd be very difficult to be absent of emotion as you're engaging mm-hmm. that. That's what you're saying. Like not necessarily that he's like there to stay, but like, you know, he's sort of confronted with this vision, right? Like um, the ties, because there's like a lot of regret, right? Like in those opening mm-hmm. scenes, like the conversation with his father and him before he leaves, you get the mm-hmm. sense that there's some regret, right? And some sadness about the fact that they may not see each other again and things they didn't do. Um, May, I'd love to hear your take on, on that, that final sequence and what it may mean. Well, first I have a question. Uh, I've not seen the other movie or the book, so this film is all the context I have. Did they blast the entire planet of radiation or just Hari? Because I remember they also sent like uh chris's encephalogram down to the planet and they said that the projection stopped when they did that i could I can double check i i interpreted it as like they got rid of hari and they decided to also go with the whatever it was called like the annihilator kind of thing mm. um as like sort of like the next step um Let's see. No, mate, you're right. So it is like his, they broadcast his brain waves to Solaris. Mm-hmm. So they, they use the annihilator on her. It's like kind of like an isolated thing. And then they send his brain waves down. So you are 100% correct. Well done. I, I, misinter- <laughs> I misunderstood. Um, no, you're which good. You're again, good. Out of context, if uh, for listeners, like uh, if you watch this movie, you'll understand how it probably be. <laughs> <laughs> to do that <laughs> but continue. so that's a great point though may um because i i can uh kind of see where where you could go with that so continue because that that changes my answer because if it understands him then to me i think it's going to start kind of modeling like him and his brain if this ocean is basically a giant brain mm-hmm. so then i think it is quite likely that um I mean, I'd be kind of split then because it could very easily just be the Solaris version of him on this little island in his new ocean of brain. Uh, or <laughs> or it could be him being like, great, this world is me. It was literally built for me. I'm going to go live here now. Um, so, yeah, I don't know which one it is, but uh, there is going to be a tie between Chris and the planet, uh, I think, for the the rest of eternity essentially what a weird uh concept too that like this planet is kind of a living entity you know like in that it doesn't necessarily have at least from what we can discern from just the film um the the novel might um add more context but like any kind of personality of its own like that it it, in of of itself is a mirror like which is something that is discussed you know in the film for whatever is around it so we get burton's story right where secretly i was like that sounds like the star child from 2001 a space odyssey that you saw there like mm-hmm. um <laughs> where uh you know he he sees this like massive manifestation of a uh of a child like floating um in the the sky uh below the the viscous uh foggy surface or whatever i don't know the whole description was wild mm-hmm. um but even that is like something that came from somebody else. Um, so I think that's just, it's a really cool design number one. And I, I totally fell on the, the the side of like, this is um, the planet is taking bits and bobs from his brain. Um, and that's where the, where these islands are, or maybe like individual memories or like compartments from his, you know, brain and existence. And uh, it's doing the best to kind of reconstruct it. I didn't, suspect that it was he was on solaris but i knew something was wrong when there was just water pouring through the ceiling and there was just like a stack <laughs> of books where i was like "Ooh, he's like hallucinating at the very least he's hallucinating this like something is like really off with this and uh, i kind of like that because that surreal quality rang true to me where like this is like if a maybe like not entirely sentient like entity was like trying to make sense of in the entirety of somebody's existence like as transmitted from their brain it probably would be a little bit off right like there would be things that wouldn't understand and would get wrong so um but i really like the the link to the final uh from like uh, sorry in the final scene to the first like you know uh the opening like in that house and and uh sort of that like idyllic um environment 
and uh, the absence of the mother uh I, I gotta ask you what do you what do you think that that's all about right like because she mm. seems to be a, a pretty formidable character as we learn more about her as the, as the movie unfolds why is the mom not there do you think is that like a subconscious desire like you know uh <laughs> he'd be happier without her around or like i like i, I don't have an answer for it but uh i'd be curious to hear your thoughts well, Hari isn't there either, and mm-hmm. I, I think we have. I have a lot of questions, at least, about how this whole uh, world, ocean brain, works. But um, it could be that an island is like a single neuron or whatever, and it stores this one memory, and you'd have to go to a different island to have a different memory, something like that. Because um, it does seem like from the intro that his mom died at some point previously. That's a good point. Hari's absence is uh, is felt in that scene because you spent so much of the the movie up to that point. Once it gets going um, with her, made so you got to make a, a final judgment call here. Is that him or is it not him? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> uh, I love to live in uh, gray zones, twilight zones, you could call them, and I will oh. uh, say it could be either. Oh, you, you, all right, fine. Keep your, <laughs> secret, keep your secrets, <laughs> as Frodo would say. Uh, that's fine. I would love to like hear your uh, thoughts on Hari, just kind of like as a character, but also as like she kind of shifts from how we first see her just appearing in the chair to like her final off-screen moments, because I think that journey is very interesting. Um both in how it relates to like her development, but also in like her relationship with Chris. Funny. She, she, to me, she's the ultimate manifestation of like being confronted with like your guilt and regret. Like this movie seems to really, really embrace like the idea of regret. Um, And I think his initial reaction of like sort of jettisoning her, uh, jettisoning her like via rocket, like out of the space station is um, just a great, sort of like metaphorical and actual like reaction of like not wanting to deal with that right and like you kind of get a little like sense from like their discussions about what what her past entailed like in their relationship that um he flees right he he like walks away and leaves and i like sort of doesn't want to be confronted or deal with the reality of, of, of the relationship. And I think that this, uh, the scene with the rocket is sort of um just a, a natural progression of that where he's like no 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 like I, I I I'm do not want to deal with this like and um I I, I like that uh, he's kind of forced to um whether or not he has any sort of peace um at the conclusion of all this I think is sort of questionable but um I do like uh that in a way she's almost like this specter that uh because she as you pointed out like cannot be left alone and so is she is physically always in close proximity to him. And um, I found that very haunting. Um, but I also found it kind of s- sweet. Um, it was it was like almost therapeutic for him to be able to vocalize where their relationship sort of soured and what happened and to kind of confess that uh, like, no, um, I didn't love you then uh but now like i do love you and like you can kind of question whether that is even like true or not you know or is he just sort of like is is the guilt kind of making him feel that way but um i thought that was a very interesting uh journey and and i like i love that that character and like i said the, the standout scene for me is the one behind will there um because i found it so just uh, disturbing and and heartbreaking in a way I'd have to agree. Um, I think that the I like. I mean, in this it, this version does a good job of that. I think the Steven Soderbergh George Clooney version also conveys that really well. I did find it interesting though how quickly the psychologist is like ready to launch his ex dead wife out of the ship, like through the <laughs> <laughs> like that's like his go to thing. He doesn't really pause very long, and he's just like, nope, not doing this. <laughs> Hey, come over here for a minute. No, it's fine. Yeah, just just come over here. It's cool. <laughs> He's so in calculating. The, yeah, <laughs> like he is like very just no, this is not happening. And but I don't know. It was weird to me that he was just he immediately jumped on doing that. I don't remember that being like the go-to thing in the book. I felt like it built like it built up a little bit more to that. 
and even in like the remake uh the Clooney one I feel like it was there was just a little bit more that was there that built up to it so that it was even more of a shock when he does that that you're just like oh shit like no what are you what what no <laughs> you know and she in the Clooney version like you see her expression when he closes the door and she just like floats on out so that uh yeah I think her character um it's Hari in in this one but I'm sorry I'm skipping around on my on my tabs over here it's Hari in this one and then it's Rhea is her name in the book and in the remake with Clooney um but I think she is the most interesting character um for what she goes through sort of her trying to understand her own existence and then like you mentioned too, I think it's I'm, I'm gonna have to be the third person to copy you guys on that. The scene where she resurrects after drinking the O2, man. It's like that is the acting, man. It's just like it is the best in the film with like the most disturbing part of the film. And so yeah, she is is it Natalia? I'm gonna butcher the name, so I apologize, but Natalia Bandarchuk or Bandar Bandarchuk, who is like she is awesome. So yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I agree with everything you two have said. Um, I also feel like with I I'm also a bit dubious that he actually does love uh Hari 2.0, but I do think it's interesting that she starts out as very literally just a reflection of his impression of her, and mm -hmm. she is very two dimensional and. Mm -hmm uh just kind of I'm, I'm reminded of all the like dead wife montages in film she's kind of like a living version of that <laughs> just like sitting and smiling and you know being the perfect doting wife um and I think it's interesting that that's the version that Chris is immediately repulsed by and tries to yeet off the space station <laughs> 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 and it's only it's only when she comes back again and starts to He's kind of forced to acknowledge that um, she has a lot more going on than just that limited perception he used to have of her. Um, like that's the version that he's struggling with letting go of. So I think that's very interesting because I'd, I'd say that's it's a reflection of her state as kind of like a, a, a new being learning the world. But I, I think also a reflection of the fact that, yeah, when a relationship takes a turn like that the version of the other person you're seeing like usually isn't that full person anymore and i think the heart-wrenching yep. part for chris is just realizing that um the version of hari and his memory wasn't like her in her entirety at all is that why maybe he can fall in love with like this one and like I... if we if we go if we you know assume for a second that he does love her is it because she's a her like a like a different person right like it like truly has become you know a, a autonomous like different version of the same woman right with like her own thoughts and feelings and experiences i think so and i think that's the only like reason i could see him actually following in love with this version of her because otherwise i'm also very dubious <laughs> yeah i don't know so... I, I i feel a little bit the other way i feel like he's just i feel like it's very selfish but that that just might be me coloring the film with my own mirror is I feel like <laughs> <laughs> the characters are all very selfish and self-centered and they can't get past that. So I think for him, it's just regret. I think he's just trying to process his regret about her and then seeing her do these things to herself. It's like he wasn't there when when she passed away the first like the the real her passed away or the real Hari, I guess, from his memory passed away. So it's just this regret that he wasn't there that then when he sees it actually physically sees it happening that i think that for him is where maybe he he almost he wants to he wants to love her he wants to like make amends for it and so i feel like that's probably where it's driving from that's just my impression though so i would much rather it be the happier version of <laughs> yes he he understood that he needed to be a better person and he liked he liked uh this version of hari but i don't know as as with most things, I think that it's probably a mix. A ambiguous is uh, <laughs> the name of the game with this movie. Yeah, I did feel really sad though, just as an end note, like when she was like when they told her told him that she was gone and that he didn't see her go again. That that was like, I don't know, that was just really sad. Sort like of note the... to him, kind of explaining, yeah. I guess, a little bit 
Um, yeah. Yeah. If that ever... looks real. Sorry. That's yeah. True. yeah, that's I'm a so great sorry. point. <laughs> no. Yeah, that, that's a great point. It could be like, yeah, 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 yeah. You uh you had a fever and um yeah, she wrote you this note and like <laughs> it's like clearly the handwriting of Sartorius. <laughs> Dear Chris, um <laughs> I always hated you. Goodbye. <laughs> um, did they ever explain why he was like sick? Why he gets the fever? Um, Chris, I mean, like I, uh, he comes down with, like that. That's sort of like the plot device that uh, allows sort of like the the weird passage of time and all that. I just want to make sure I I didn't miss that lack of sleep, maybe. But that's yeah. the only thing I saw. Okay, I was making yeah, sure because sure. uh, we already established that I totally <laughs> I missed the, oh, no. <laughs> the radiation plot. So, like, yeah, but I, again, I, I'm 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 willing to own that. Um, just because of <laughs> like, there's a lot of technical jargon thrown around and like discussions and musings on what they should or shouldn't do. Well, that is film number one uh, down for Andre Tarkovsky. Uh, again, I appreciate you both bearing with me. I I will be honest. I had a little bit of anxiety as I was watching this. It was like, oh man, I have no idea how Will or Bay are gonna <laughs> react to this because it is very <laughs> slow and weird. But um, you know, it's one of those things that I think is like it is in the pantheon, and as is our next film, Stalker, of like great films, especially Russian cinema, which um you know had uh has a, has a really interesting history um so i i'm excited to see stalker um some themes to look out for i have not i promise like google or wikipedia anything but like i'm automatically going to be looking out for like nature versus sort of like science and technology and then like regret and guilt but uh, what else did you guys pick up on like what what is on your radar as you watch a, a film that's supposed to be thematically close to solaris and have some evolution of ideas i'd be curious to get your take on that before we wrap the episode disjointed philosophical language <laughs> yeah. i feel like that's a safe uh... bet <laughs> Hmm. And I say that lovingly. <laughs> Lots of unhappy people. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly don't like. Uh, don't want to come have this come across as like stereotyping, like you know, people of the Soviet Union of the seventies. But like historically, what I've read about that time and place, like that kind of makes sense to me, like a little bit. Um, but I could be wrong, but I, I haven't put it this way. I've not come across a lot of Russian literature or films that are happy go lucky in nature at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like that is probably a very sound prediction, uh, for stalker, uh, anything else, any, any other, uh, themes, uh, you're on the lookout for as we, we go into, uh, to our, our second and final film of this director drill down. You said it was how long again? <laughs> <laughs> it's about the same length. Uh, he oh, loves yeah. his, he loves his long like two-hour, 45-minute films. Yeah, We might um, get this... another scene where we go on the highway for about two to three minutes and just kind of cruise. Oh, Jesus. I was like, <laughs> is this looping? <laughs> like, what is going on? Like, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Oh, uh, randomly switching between color and black and white. I uh, actually am glad you <laughs> mentioned that because I was, yeah, I completely forgot. But yes, that, yeah. Long panning exactly. shots that don't like cut the time between characters walking to each other. You just you just watch them walk. <laughs> I I did speaking of like some of the camera stuff. I did love the cinematography and there were some great little trick shots and like disorienting stuff. I think that's really mm -hmm. good. So I'm hoping for more of that in Stalker, where like I got like lost a little bit with like where people were and like what was like you know like the orientation of things. Um, I, if it makes you feel any better, I do know Stalker is regarded as the better movie, like in most circles, like okay. tends to place a little bit higher and, um, is like, I've seen some, some, uh, some shots from it on some of the Twitter film accounts and it looks stunning. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. Cool. And then there's a video game coming out, uh, next year, hopefully if the fighting in Ukraine settles down and I hope for the people in Ukraine and the people of Russia, it does, um, uh, settle down. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was a, a video, a PC video game. Uh, and this is going to be a sequel. I think it's called Stalker 2. So um, it'll nice. give me some context for what that is. And maybe I'll do like a little little stream at some point of playing the original. Yes. And 
see how it uh, how it all holds up and connects and all that good stuff so well that, that about does it for for this week uh we'll we'll be splitting this into kind of a 0.5 again you know um to just make it more palatable for for us and for for you guys not to have to watch two movies uh per week so we're building uh, in our- an intermission <laughs> yeah exactly we're building in an intermission i love that um so you know the next episode will be a continuation of this it's a director drill down it'll be like you know whatever episode i forget what take we're on at this point but 0.5 and it'll be stalker so um yeah, hope you guys check it out and enjoy it and until next week we we love you bye bye, bye guys <laughs>